great opportunity for us. And we would like to thank you, Madam, for giving us this opportunity of listening to one of your lectures. Uh, Professor Chokoboki happens to be one of the finest scholars in the country right now. He is a polyglot. He is a person with a deep profundity of learning. And she is also a person who is capable of expressing herself with a enormous beauty of simplicity. And uh, before I go any further, I'd like to let you ask the head of the department of the English department of Sister Nigeria University, that's me for sure, Professor Kubal Varsovi, to make a formal introduction. Professor Varsovi, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. A very good evening to Professor Chakraborty, to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, and to my colleagues and our dear students. Today we are on the fourth edition of our Saturday with the Scholar program, and we are very happy to have with us Professor Dr. Sudeshna Chakraborty. Professor, Ch Professor Chakraborty has had a long and illustrious academic career. She received her Bachelor of Arts in English from Presidency College in 1968. Thereafter, Thereafter, she traveled to the United Kingdom and obtained her master's in English from the University of Cambridge in 1971. She completed her doctoral program from Jadavpur University in 1984. She has also obtained her second master's on history from London University in 2001. Besides English, she is comfortable with three other European languages, French, German and Spanish. She taught at Presidency College in Calcutta and she retired as professor in English from the University of Calcutta. Author of several books and articles in English and Bengali, she has traveled and lectured widely across continents. Madam, we are really privileged to have you with us this evening. May we now request you to deliver your talk on Charles Baudelaire complex patterns of good and evil in his multicolored flower garden. Ma'am. I thank you. I thank the University of Sister Nivedita for giving me this honor and for giving me the opportunity of speaking on Baudelaire. And I thank my audience and I'm looking forward to interaction with them. As it happened, I've taught Baudelaire for almost 30 years in the University of Calcutta, and he's, and let us say, a super favorite of mine. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity of speaking of him. Now, uh, Charles Baudelaire, who was uh, born in Paris and in, in, in 1721, uh, and died in 1867, also an extremely complex figure. His multicolored garden of flowers is made up of many colored flowers, of good evil, which were closely intertwined in his works. Baudelaire hardly needs an introduction to the Bengali. Our Buddha Devush, in particular, one of our greatest writers, has done familiar with the Bengali region. And in fact, after Buddha's translation and comments had been published, there was really a Baudelaire wave among the younger poetry lovers of Bengali. Sometimes these fads were too far, and they thought that Baudelaire was the sole representative of modernity, and that even Rabindranath somewhat outdated. This view roused the anger of Rabindranath the scholar Abu Sayyid Ayub, and he wrote a whole book, such a number of books, 
contradicting this. Are you went too far in the other direction? This is a thought that Baudelaire was a genius, perhaps, than evil. Yes. Are you rather uh, made fun of the new Baudelaire and ca calling them drinkers and addicts? One whose uh, uh, main motto was to change the Sanskrit sloka. Ankrita yes. That is say the new Bola fan drinkers and no, I went too far. We should try to understand Baudelaire. It is evil. Many well, let's say peculiar also is real genius. Altwood was one of the greatest no doubt about that, but rather complex and contradictory and somewhat hard to understand. Something of the time the poet, of course, have to be considered. Young Charles was born in an affluent family and his, his father died he was also was brought up by his mother. The second day of his adult mother was Chokovic, both there, but has never recovered. His stepfather, Arpik, one of the most prominent men in France at that time, and of great importance in military and diplomatic service. But both never liked him, and when he was sent away to his boarding schools, he considered this some form of exile, even though it was meant to give him an excellent education. And when both there participated in the revolution of 1848, we'll come to that later, he cried out, it is said, we must shoot General Orpic. This seems to indicate that his personal and political anger were intertwined. Although it must be said that this anecdote has never been confirmed. Maybe it is just a story. And anyway, after his graduation, Baudelaire became involved with the literary and bohemian circle in Paris and became acquainted with many of the prominent writers of that day. To take him away from this circle, his family arranged a world tour for him. The world tour wasn't actually a, what you call a world tour. For both there was what, what is called an armchair traveler. He wrote a great deal about travels to distant lands and the description and things like that. But he himself did not travel very long or very far. Then anyway, at this time, he met a personal reverse. His father had left him a considerable fortune, but his family believed that he would fritter away all the money left himself. So, by a judicial order, there is an order of the court, a family council was appointed to look after his property, over which Baudelaire himself would have control. Again, the reason for his anger against society and his family. Let's take a look at the bad change and violence too much. The old royal family had been restored through France by the victorious allies, let's just say uh, England, Prussia, and so on, after the Battle of Waterloo. 
However, the restored regime was short-lived, and after the revolution of 1830, the, the next branch of the royal family, the House of Orleans, was placed on the throne. The so-called July monarchy lasted about two decades, but in 1848, a time of Europe-wide revolutions, this monarchy too was over this monarchy too was overthrown. And Baudelaire, as we have seen, participated in the event. And on the other hand, there was an extreme conservative side of both this character. I mean, he was somebody who was radical and who actually participated in the revolution, is uh, actually bearing weapons, and he also edited a journal, I believe it is called the Moderate, in support of the revolution. But at the same time, there was a conservative how shall I say, angle to his character. The two men who influenced him most were very different from each other. One was Edgar Allan Poe, American writer of mystery and horror stories, also a poet. The other was Joseph de Maistre. Joseph de Maistre who was one of the chief of the counter-revolutionary thinkers, those, uh, those who uh, attacked every side of the French Revolution and tried to return to the pre-revolutionary times. These were the two men who had the greatest influence on both left. Even among conservative thinkers, De Maistre was somewhat bizarre and exceptional. He believed that society rested on bloodshed, that there were three pillars of society, the soldier who shed blood in battle, the executioner who shed blood on the scaffold, and the priest who justified these deeds. This a historian has remarked is closer to the old Aztec religion. Aztec, that is to say, the people of people of ancient Mexico who believed in immoderate blood sacrifices. The historian said that uh, the ideas of Demis was closer to this bloodthirsty Aztec religion than to anything that is close to Christianity. The executioner image, in fact, appears in Baudelaire once or twice. In one of his poems is Voice to Cithair, that is to say, a voice to the island of Venus, the goddess of love and beauty. It is supposed to be an extremely beautiful island. But here the poet sees the rotting body of a dead man hanging from the gallows. And beasts and birds are prey tearing him to pieces as though they were the executioners. This is a bitter parody of the themes of love and beauty and which also perhaps shows the influence of the Maestre. The contradictions appear also in the political and social ideas of both led. In fact, his views range from great devotion to God to a revolt against God, at least the Judeo-Christian deity we see in the Bible. In one of his early poems, Benediction, the blessing, the poet welcomes the sorrows sent by God as 
his gifts sent to purify human soul, the human soul, and prepare it for heaven. A poem like this has uh, inspired French Catholic writers such as Moriac to welcome Baudelaire as a brother, Albert, and Edding brothers. Uh, Professor, could I interrupt for a second, please? Uh, some of your words are getting a little lost over the net. Could you speak directly into the microphone? Lost in the net. You know, you know, when it, when it is coming to us, the words are a bit broken and interrupted. So, could you please directly, you know, speak, uh, talk into the microphone directly, with your mouth closed to the mouthpiece. You know, if your mouth is closer to the microphone, maybe that will make things better. Oh, sir, may I offer a suggestion? Yes, please do. Ah, uh, yeah, it co also could be a problem of the internet. So, in case ma'am can uh, go out and reconnect, perhaps sometimes the connection improves that way, and then the voice doesn't get cracked. It could also be because of the internet connection. I think, think ma'am has rejoined. I think ma'am has rejoined. Has she rejoined? Ma'am has rejoined. Yeah, okay, but, yes, the prob video. but the problem is persisting, unfortunately. Mm, ma'am, if, if you are using a microphone along, which has a headphone attached to it, if you can just bring the microphone like this closer to your mouth in this particular position, then it will help, I think. Uh, MB, MB, yes. Yeah, she has left the meeting. Yeah, ma'am has left. Ma she has rejoined. Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, can you see my uh, screen? Ma'am, hello? Yes. Could I speak now? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, yeah ma'am. If you can, if you are using a microphone along, along with a headset, just bring the microphone at this distance, ma'am. This distance. Where we will be using a good response of the microphone, ma'am. Now we'll say to headphone, microphone adapter. Ma'am, after after headphone, it is a little down here, na. If you can just adjust it to this length, this height, I mean, then it will work better. We're getting disruptions in the sound, so. Morning, Kinkini. Do you are you using a headphone? Can you demonstrate it for ma'am? I think she's getting a little confused. Um, I don't know. I think uh, okay. my kind I of headphone, I won't be able to. Well, I'll, 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 try. Which is like this. I'll, I'll try. I'll yeah, try. Just, I'll try. Uh, just try. Uh, I, I, I am also using a. Yeah, I'm also using a similar yeah, headphone. Yeah, I'm having this one. So this is just okay. Like yeah. Okay. Is, okay. Hang on a second. I'll, I, I'll try. I'll try. Mm -hmm. I'll try. Mm -hmm. Just try. Uh, uh, ma'am. Ma'am. Yes. Uh, uh, can you can you see me? Yes. Ma'am. So this this happens to be this little thing happens to be my microphone. Okay, ma'am, can you see me? Uh, this little yes. thing happens to be my yes, microphone. Yes. Now, now can you hear me? Yeah. If you hold the hold the microphone, uh, which is probably a longer one. Uh, in your case, I can't see what kind of microphone you're using. If you well, you can hold it close. Using yeah. If you hold it close to you. Having like this. Yeah, if it if it has okay, if it is can you hear me now? Yes, a little better, yeah, but we can't better. see you. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I think, yes. Yes. I, think I, I think now we can hear her. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry for this trouble. No, no, that yes. is okay. Perfectly fine, ma'am. No, we were just we don't want to miss out on any of the word yeah, that you're saying. But now you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, yes. okay. Then Thank I'll so go on from where I'd left. Well, yes. it, is, it is this, the 
in the the section of Lifla Dumal entitled Revolt, God appears as a jealous, cruel tyrant, and Satan is a real and Satan is a real friend of man. Like Prometheus in Greek mythology, who brought fire to man against the will of the gods, Satan teaches man the secrets of science and technology. There is even a Miltonic hint in showing Satan as one who discovered gunpowder. Moreover, Satan is the friend of the oppressed, the downtrodden. In other poem, Cain and Abel, Baudelaire pictures Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam and Eve, as representatives of different classes. Cain is the oppressed proletariat, while Abel is the capitalist. The last line of that poem goes as follows. Race of Cain, rise to heaven and throw down God from his throne. This kind of political philosophical allegory was not uncommon in the radical literature of the day. Here, the metaphysical revolt is identified with an actual revolt. Then, Satan and Cain were like the fighters of ba the barricades whom Baudelaire had met in 1848. Baudelaire paints a striking picture of Paris with its glamour and squalor. The Poet declares that the contours of a city change faster than the heart of man, and he portrays the changing skyline of Paris. The, with the great city appears in its different aspects. The poet shows the flotsam and jetsam of the city. That is, those who are uh, really almost scattered the wastes of the city. There are old women who, who were once loving and beautiful, but who are now <laughs> only empty shells. In one poem, which Baudelaire in fact later dramatized, a drunkard, an alcoholic, kills his wife in the Parisian streets in order to set her free from further misery. At dawn, the heavy wheeled carts rolled into the city, bringing provision and crushing the head of the murderer who lies on the streets. Such poems show an aspect of uh, Paris, of France, discussed at this time, <coughs> dangerous classes and laboring classes. Dangerous classes and laboring classes. The two are identified. The theme of alienation runs through both their poetry. Alienation, being separate from others, solitude. For example, in one of his most famous poems, the swan. Baudelaire's swan is not like the swan of, say, Mallarmé, a fellow French poet. The Mallarmé's swan is a creature of the air and skies, but Baudelaire's swan is a very <coughs> urban swan, prosaic swan, a Parisian swan. It has escaped from a menagerie. <coughs> and now goes about the streets, taking the gutters in search of water. And together with a negress who has been 
stranded in Paris, far from her sunny climes, <coughs> and like a character, a tragic character from ancient Greek literature, <coughs> the swan is seen as a symbol of alienation of exile, of solitude. Uh, another, <coughs> another recurring theme is what is called as ennui, E-N-N-U-I. This term is almost untranslatable. In French, it means sorrow, grief, it also means boredom, the extreme limit of boredom. Boredom that is relieved by luxury. The poet imagines Anuri as smoking a hookah and dreaming of scaffolds. In a prose poem, a prince sends a man to a subtle, cruel death simply in order to relieve his own boredom. The an important part of Baudelaire is his aesthetic, you know, his theories of beauty, his pictures of beauty. Some, like Sartre, you know, Sartre in his famous book on Baudelaire, have noted here a slight influence of Swedenborg. Swedenborg, the great northern philosopher. However, Baudelaire's ideas are quite original. He, it goes to put it briefly, he identifies one sense with another. He thinks that one sense can convey the uh, the effect of another. We see with our ears, hear with our eyes, touch with our taste. And this this is an idea which has been called the theory of correspondence. The theory of correspondence appears in more than one poem. The poet imagines the the song of the sailors, song of the sailors, madness from distant lands, which place before him the pictures of exotic trees in distant countries. And Beauty, too, appears in different ways, in different forms. In a series of sonnets, Baudelaire portrays what he considers the different kinds of beauty. There is classical beauty that is quite static and unmoving. Its very beauty is, lies in the fact that it's, it is unmoving. Then there is a kind of beauty associated with horror and tragedy, which for which both there gives examples, Lady Macbeth, Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth, or the Statue of Night by Michelangelo, Michel Ange. These are signs of sort uh, symbols of beauty associated with tragedy and horror. And uh, Above all, the Baudelaire was obsessed by sense. He was, really wrote almost a, a whole book on sense. He classified at least 50 kinds of sense, and each with a special characteristic. Each with a special characteristic, a special symbol. For instance, there are scents that are pure, and innocent as the flesh of a child, 
and on the other hand their vicious sensual sense for oh, this you have been a specialist on the theme and then sight and sound are almost always linked in both that well his black venus jean duval we'll see her again later adorned her beauty with jewels that sparkled and tinkled at the same time combining light and sound light and music then the networks of imagery that lies throughout the poetry of Baudelaire are remarkable for instance Paris in the rainy season is compared to a huge casserole with its lid shut tight then Baudelaire does not bring in nature except on rare occasions and the swan for instance that even that swan we have seen is very much a city swan otherwise he brings nature only in, on rare occasions his images are of jewels and precious stones jewels and precious stones and uh, uh, our own Robindonath who was not a particular Baudelaire fan blamed the French poet for always talking of furniture but actually his ideas were of jewels and precious stones in fact in one poem Parisian dream the poet the denotes this world not only humanity of humanity but of nature and it's made up the world I mean it's made up entirely of jewels and precious stones this one is the, this is the extreme point to which both there goes in his jewel image but the jewel image appears in uh, different forms for example uh, he compares the sorrows sent by God to purify the human soul we have seen this theme with note this word deep sea pearls deep sea pearls and the lost jewels of ancient Palmyr Palmyr a famous ancient city why Palmyr I think the explanation is this that very ancient very famous almost mythical cities sometimes appeared in poetry as symbols of beauty the way R. Jivanananda has said Chultar, Kabekar, Andhakar, Bidishar, Nisha, Vukhtar, Sramustir, Karukarcho and again a jewel appears in a different form in the in a poem in the Parisian pictures we see a red-haired beggar girl whose rags cover her charms she of course cannot dream of any jewelry any adornment except very cheap imitation jewels and even these are beyond her reach we see here both the sympathy for the deprived the downtrodden the other side of glittering Paris again the jewels appear in a strange way in the cat image both there apparently was fond of cats and there are three cat poems in Le Fleur du Mal there are various significances but the we can understand that the jewel that is generally called the cat's eye you see the significance the now so when Romina said that both ledger's root of furniture he is not being quite fair 
one can call Baudelaire perhaps the, the poet laureate of jewels, precious stones, gold, pearls, diamonds, and so on. Now, let us come to the love poetry of Baudelaire. Baudelaire was undoubtedly one of the greatest love poets of the world, but like his own life, the, his love poetry is rather complex and even twisted. There are apparently three Venuses. You understand what I mean? Three ladies whom he called Venus in Baudelaire's life. There's a white Venus, Apolloni Sabatier. The white Venus, Apolloni Sabatier. The green eyed Venus, Marie de Bras. Green eyed Venus, Marie de Bras, an actress. And the black Venus, or dark Venus, Jean Duval. Jean Duval. Jean was given the title of the Black Venus partly because of her dark, semi African beauty. She was of mixed blood, apparently, and also because of her dark or evil soul. Dark or evil soul. Jean and Baudelaire spent years and years of a complex, violent, love-hate relationship. The poet sees Jean as a reverse Venus, one will lead him to hell rather than heaven. On the other hand, the white Venus is seen as a true Beatrice, a symbol of goodness and beauty. But even here, there's a tinge of bitterness. The poet sometimes wants to inject a little of his own poison into the ideal Venus. It is in the poem, To Her Who Is Too Gay. As for Marie de Bras, the green-eyed Venus, her special brand of charm is identified with the calm, orderly beauty of the low countries in an invitation to a, a voyage. It is there that he wants to take his green-eyed Venus. Besides the Venus poems, Baudelaire wrote other kinds of love poems, they're the series of his lesbian poems, his lesbos poems, portraying a, a tragic, perverse kind of love. Then Don Juan, Don Juan, or Don Juan, or Don Juan, appears in a poem, Don Juan in Hell. This poem, we shall come to it later again, this poem is influenced both by the play of Moliere, on the same subject, and by a painting of Delacroix, one of the greatest painters of the day, also showing Don Juan in hell. This perhaps is close to his theory of correspondence that a picture can express a poem and the other way around. Baudelaire, because he is a mirror of the genius and tragic life of the writer. He thus speaks to the reader, hypocrite reader, my image, my brother, hypocrite reader, my image, my brother. And this might be said to constitute the obituary of the great poet. And uh, indeed, Love, in Baudelaire's life, to continue the theme, was an extremely complex affair. Sometimes he was attracted to particularly horrible women. For instance, in the poem, 
the horrible twist. Then in yet another poem, he imagines himself bound to his beloved, possibly the Black Venus, as he puts it in this way, as a convict is tied to his chain, as an addict is tied to drink or gambling. He wants to get rid of her, but he knows that if she does die, he will want her revived. The knife and the poison whose help he requests to destroy the beloved reply mockingly, if you really kill her, your tears will again resurrect the vampire. So no use helping you to kill her. And the, the and sometimes not only the faults but even the virtues of the beloved become annoying. In one of his prose poems, the hero or anti-hero kills his mistress because she is unbearably perfect. The, the adored one is sometimes subject to the fury of the poet. Indeed, as thought puts it clearly in his uh, book on Baudelaire, the only kind of women whom Baudelaire loves is unavailable beyond his reach. He wants to adore the white Venus from afar. At first he sends her anonymous letters, not revealing his identity. When she discovers who he is, and wants a more intimate relationship, the poet simply moves away. Again, Marie Dabra apparently loved another man, but the poet does not resent this. He is glad that she exists, that there is such a person on earth. And again, the idea that he preferred women well, let's say in disguise, women dressed in a different way uh, from the ordinary. That is again, again appears more than once in Baudelaire. Take for instance uh, one of his short stories, Far Far Low. Baudelaire didn't write many stories, but he wrote some, and some of his prose poems too have the quality of a short story. Anyway, Far Far Low goes like this. Samuel was advancing towards her, towards, saw advancing towards him, the new goddess of his heart, in the radiant and sacred splendor of her nudity. But Samuel, by a strange whim, began to cry out like a spoiled child, I want Columbin! Give me Columbin! Give me Columbin! Give, give her to me! as she first appeared to me, that evening when she maddened me with her fantastic dress, her costume of a juggler. I was astonished at first. She accepted the eccentricity of the man whom she had chosen, and she called her maid Flora. The chambermaid came out when Jenner, who had been pulling at the bell, thundered, Don't forget the rouge! That is to say, Fafalo must appear in all her makeup and her, let's say, stage costume. A Columbin was a female figure in the Italian puppet theatre. Apparently, Fafalo was playing that role. This shows that it was the, let's say, the disguise, the 
dress the makeup of the beloved that attracted Baudelaire. So they actually, Fafarlo was an early work by Baudelaire, but again to quote Sartre, Sartre in his famous book on Baudelaire, the early work contains many of the qualities, many of the characteristics of his mature work as well, particularly this uh, uh, theme of uh, this uh, of costume and makeup and so on. The, in fact, the importance of symbols, of signs, recurs in Baudelaire. To take one of his prose poems, a rather grim story, the poet, we are told, had employed a young boy, and for some reason, probably for some suspicion, he dismisses the boy. The boy hangs himself. A terrible event which shocks the poet. The mother of the dead boy comes to take the rope with which her son had hanged herself. The poet thinks that he, he wants to preserve this as a memory of her great tragedy, but later he finds out another reason. Apparently, in those days, a rope in which a man had been hanged or hanged himself was considered to bring good luck and fetched a good price on the market. And this was the mother's real intention. In fact, the heartless mother and cruel mistress we have seen are also repeated figures in, in Baudelaire, in Benedictio, in Blessing, the cruel mother and uh, false mistress appear to be, well, the poles of evil, the opposite pole from the divine blessing. The, the, again, the rope, like the rouge, is a symbol, and the sort puts it, the hatred of Baudelaire caused him to choose the material things as the symbols of the immaterial. That is to say, his hatred of life is hatred of the world. And again, we come to the scent image, scent image which seems to bring together the dead and the living, to quote one of his poems. Sometimes we find an old flask from which spurts a living soul which returns. And if the soul of the dead is conserved in a flask of scent, which is which is resembled the man when he lived. Love in Baudelaire, since we are discussing his love poetry, has yet another aspect. In the relation between the lovers is that between the master and the slave, the dominator and the dominated. In one in one poem, I think I believe the in he speaks of the slaves of the Moors who enjoyed freedom and happiness on certain days. That is certain days where the slave was the master of the master. Again in one of his lesbian poems, Farm Damne, Damned Women, the couple consists of two women, Delphine, who is older and stronger, and Hippolyte, who is young and who has just lost her innocence. And yet, the, the younger, weaker women, dominates the stronger one. We are told, strong beauty on her knees in front of weak beauty, frail beauty. The strong women on her knees before the frail beauty, the weak beauty. Again, the two are compared to wolves running in the 
desert, symbols of solitude, or being cut off from the rest. Again, a theme of Baudelaire, we seem somewhat inconsistent, his childhood memories. Childhood memories appears in such poems as the great hearted maid servant of whom you are jealous, or I have not forgotten at all the neighbor of my city. The great hearted servant maid in question is a maid servant, a nurse who looked after little Charles when he was a child. The child became so attached to his nurse that even his mother was slightly jealous, since the great hearted servant of whom you are jealous, you meaning his mother. But the poet wonders what would happen if now, after years, the ghost of the old serving maid would appear before him? What would she say to him? Or he to her? Could there be any communication between a genius and an old semi literate peasant woman? And the poet regretfully thinks of the great gap, the abyss that separates the dead and the living. These are the lines The dead, the dead suffer much when the breath of autumn, the sad breath which strips the trees of their leaves, goes round the graves, the dead must think the living are very ungrateful. And the other side of the coin, in his poem, Seven Old Women, old women appear childlike. You see what I mean? If, uh, if an old woman is com or a ghost compared with his childhood memories, in another of his poems, is the old women who become childlike. We are told that the coffins of old women resemble the coffins of little girls, as though the dead woman with age has shrunk in size, become smaller. And childhood, age, death are all brought together. Or punch me it, or to on it, How much more time do I have, please? Uh, sir, you are on mute, sir. Sir, sir you are not audible, sir. Should be, sir, you are not audible. Yeah. Still not audible. Uh, madam, please continue. Okay. Are, it's wonderful listening to you. So please continue. But Don't, can you hear me, please? We can hear you. Sometimes there's an audio problem because your microphone could be you know better brought closer to your mouth you know the microphone that you have if it could be brought closer to your mouth maybe that would be more helpful yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead yes please please continue ma'am so i think ma'am has disconnected somehow she needs to reconnect she is going to, I'm sure she's going to come back. Maybe hmm. there's a yeah. Maybe there's an internet problem. Yeah, or maybe she's deliberately logged off because she wants to make you know the voice quality better. Perhaps.
Yes, madam, please continue. Madam, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Much okay, better. Okay. Thank you. Please okay, continue. I'm sorry. The sometimes the old woman is revived in one po eh? Madam, please take another 20-25 yes, yes, yes. minutes time. No problem at all. Please continue okay. another 20-25 minutes. 25 minutes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, in some cases, the old woman who has become childlike is also revived. In one poem called The Little Old Women, both the pictures and old women sitting in a park listening to a band playing military music as was the custom in those days suddenly the old woman becomes revived we are told that her face her eyes are like those of an old eagle is there any connection between the old woman and the military did she lose a near and dear one in the war we the mystery is not solved, but we are shown the influence of military music, martial music, in transforming an old woman. Childhood, the age, death, all appear close to each other. Self-doubt, questioning oneself, is other both less themes. In one of his poems, Beatrice, we are told that we have been already told that the black Venus. Is something like a reverse Beatrice leading him not into heaven but to hell. And once he sees he's surrounded by demons to whom the beloved throws evil caresses. And the demons mock the poet, saying that he's a shadow of a Hamlet, the parody of a Hamlet, suffering from self doubt, self questioning, but not of the stature of Shakespeare's hero. A kind of Hamlet parody. And let's come to another theme of Baudelaire. The different aspects of his poetry, romantic, classical, and neoclassical. What do classical and neoclassical mean? In the French context, in the context of French poet, classical means, of course, of uh, liter literature, the, the culture of ancient Greece and Rome. Neoclassical refers to French literature of the 17th century, particularly the great dramatists, Corneille and Racine in tragedy, Moliere in comedy. These three collectively might be considered <coughs> the French equivalent of Shakespeare. And their influence is felt on Baudelaire also. The, <coughs> the classical references are scattered through his poetry like jewels. Take for instance what we've already seen, the Greek heroine who appears in the swan. In the heart of modern Paris, his own Paris, Baudelaire brings in a heroine from ancient literature, from Homer, Virgil, and Euripides, and so on. Thank you. The odd remark appears in all these great writers. She was the wife of Hector, the greatest hero of Troy, the eldest son and heir of King Priam. But Hector was killed in war, and the women of the captured city were carried off by the victors, as was the custom in those days. Andromach falls to the share of Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles. But in, in Virgil, she is 
I mean the Enid of Virgil, she escapes to that to a small distant Trojan colony, which had been founded by a number of Trojans escaping from the destroyed city. There she marries Elenus, a younger brother of Hector, who had also survived. This is a, as he appears in Virgil. Audremark enters French literature, French neoclassical tragedy, through a play by Racine of the same name, a play by Racine of the same name of Andromaque. In Racine's play, the son of Hector and Andromaque is still alive, and Pyrrhus blackmails her, saying that he will kill the child unless she agrees to marry him. In the end, there's a lot of complications and a great many tragedies. But finally, the Andromach and the child are saved. Andromach, in both classical and neoclassical literature, is shown as a symbol of suffering virtue, the ideal wife and mother, in contrast to the false Helen of Troy, but one whose fate was not favorable. Both their presence on remark in, in this way is in one of his is the swan poem. Odd remark, I think of you, a few dots. Odd remark from the arms of a great husband fallen, bowed in ecstasy in front of an empty tomb, widow of Hector, and alas, the wife of Elenus. Elenus, of course, is not the equal of his elder brother. But Andromark now has no choice. As for the, the, the bowed in ecstasy in front of an empty tomb, the tomb is empty because it is only an imitation tomb. The real grave of Hector lies in distant Troy. But even the empty tomb, the mock tomb, is a center for the lament of Andromark. And as we've seen, Andromark, like the Negress, like the Swan, is a symbol of alienation, of solitude. Another classical, that is, figure, that is a figure from ancient Greek literature or mythology, appears in another poem of Baudelaire, Lament of Iker. Iker. The theme is this, Daedalus, the master craftsman of Greek mythology made wings of wax. His son Ikeir, putting on the wings, flew close to the sun, but the wax wings melted in the heat of the sun and he fell to the earth and was killed. This is possibly an image of the flight of genius, the excessive aspiration of genius of a poet which ends in tragedy. Or again in, a, in the, again, in another of his poems, a classical reference to the Dawn Age. The Dawn Age of Greek mythology were condemned to fill pictures which became empty immediately. Baudelaire sees this as a symbol of eternal hatred that is never quenched. Or again, another reference, take Cretius. Cretius, a half historical, half mythical king of ancient Lydia. He was supposed to be the richest of men, and therefore, like Abel, he becomes a, becomes a symbol of wealth, of modern capitalism, someone whom Satan and Cain oppose. The classical drama also shows an influence on, on, on Baudelaire. We have already seen that the Don Juan in Hell, Don Juan, Don Juan, or Don Juan in Spanish, is much influenced by the Don Juan of Moliere. Even some of the figures are the same, like Dona Elvire, the suffering wife, the commander with his sword, the commander whom Juan had killed and who takes Juan to Hell, and above all, the 
final comic figure, Sainarel, who cries out, my master has gone to hell without paying my wages. And, uh, or sometimes he, in his poetry, he takes over figures from Molière's drama, like Arpagon from Molière's La Verre, the miser. Molière shows the miser as an old man, a fully fledged miser. Baudelaire imagines what Art Bagot might have been as a young man. That's the beginning of his obsession with money. Or Selimane, the light hearted, beautiful coquette who appears in, um, in the, misanthrope, the Misanthrope on the play of Molière. These characters are original, both their own creations, yet recognizable as figures from Molière. Baudelaire he bring, brings in another character, Satan. Satan, who appears more than once, is a natural gardener in the for the flaws of, of evil. And here we are told. Satan plays his greatest trick, making men disbelieve in his existence. That is his greatest trick. And there we find in Baudelaire a balance between the old and the new, traditional and the modern. For example, um, about the women of his Lesbos poems. The critic, the German critic, or rather Austrian critic anyway, Walter Benjamin, points out that Baudelaire's lesbians are both modern and traditional. They are modern women in the sense that they stand on their own feet, they're not dependent on men. On the other hand, they are tied to the ancient classics by their names. For instance, the damned women, uh, they are named Delphine and Hippolyte, two ancient French, uh, to ancient Greek names, not a modern French name like uh, Jean or Marie. And also there is Sappho, the poetess of ancient Greece, who is, in a sense, the patroness of, this, of the lesbians. And um, let's come to some of the, some of the foibles or the peculiar characteristics of Baudelaire. For one thing, he was obsessed by the fact that he was born the son of a relatively old man. He writes to one of his friends that, uh, I am sick, sick. I have a horrible temperament and it's the fault of my parents. I suffer because of them. It is because I'm the child of a mother of 27 and a father who was 62 years old. A disproportionate pathological senile union. Think of it, 45 years of difference. You have studied phys you, that is the friend, you have studied physiology with Claude Bardard. Ask your master what he thinks of the accidental fruits of such mating. Claude Bardard was one of the greatest physiologists of the time. All his ideas are not accepted today, but that's another matter. But actually, as Sartre points out, Baudelaire increases the age of his father by some 10 years. Why? Just to prove that the marriage of his parents was very unnatural, very bad, and that he is a fruit of it. The is a fruit of it. The as Sartre puts it, the sentence of the expert, in this case the physiologist, the doctor, uh, Claude uh, Barnard, will be terrible. It will fill him with fear that he wants to feel. But the fear will not be wholly real since he had falsified the uh, part of his trick. Baudelaire always reserves 
an issue. He often felt that he, Baudelaire, was possessed by some evil force or that he was insane. He once writes to his uh, fellow author, Flaubert, that always I have been obsessed by the impossibility of explaining some action or subtle thought without the hypothesis that it is the intervention of some evil force outside myself. That is to say, he was perhaps possessed by the devil, as people in the Middle Ages believed, or that he was insane. In fact, he always blamed himself and yet showed that he was innocent because he was a fruit of some, he was driven by some outside force. Both there was without doubt a man of paradox. Was he a rebel or a revolutionary? As Sartre puts it, did he actually want to change society or did he want only to attack it like a game? While he rebelled against those in high places, he also sometimes sought their favor. For example, he was once put in the dock for his supposedly immoral writing, uh, his, and he asked for the help for the intercession of Empress Eugenie, the consort of Louis Napoleon. Uh, the, again, the theme of guilt and punishment was a frequent one. Christians at least the early Christians believed, medieval Christians believed that sinners were condemned to an eternity of hell. However, modern Christians, the Christians of Baudelaire's time, even believing Christians, did not believe that a merciful God could be quite so cruel as to doom someone to eternity of hell. One of these disbelievers, unbelievers in the eternity of hell was George Sarr, a famous female author, a contemporary of Baudelaire, but whom he disliked for various reasons. Let's say George Sarr den denies that there is eternal damnation. And Baudelaire, in one of his books, remarks caustically, the women saw denies the eternity of hell. She has an interest in doing so. Meaning that if there was an eternal hell, eternal damnation, then George Saint would suffer from it and she did merit eternal damnation. The, and we have seen also his contradiction the revolutionary of the barricades of 1848 was also a disciple of an arch conservative like de Mestre. And again, at one point, Baudelaire makes, a, in one of his writings, I mean, Baudelaire makes a very curious point that his, that was the evil side of him that was a Republican, that he was a Republican by, this is meant a radical a leftist perhaps but with the evil side of his nature. That is to say, revolt was identified with evil, even within his own heart. And again, the disguise theme appears, disguise or transformation theme appears in another of his books, Artificial Paradises. Artificial Paradises. This is a book about addiction, addiction to opium or alcoholism. Both of these are disguise or transformation in some kind because addiction changes a man 
or disguises a man's nature. Baudelaire compares opium and wine, and curiously, he thinks wine is better because drinking is, well, a social activity, while opium means a solitary vice. The greater part of artificial paradises, the adaptation or translation of the English author D. Quincy. D. Quincy is famous because opium eaters, D. Quincy, um, uh, right, one of the lake poets, a friend of Coleridge and Wordsworth, and he wrote his autobiography of his life as an opium addict. But yeah, the th but although about half the book is an adaptation or translation, both those original ideas also appear there. There, De Quincey and his Confessions of an Opium Eater. To conclude, in the words of a French critic, Michel Larry. The life of and work of Baudelaire can be painted in the following fashion. To quote, everything being taken account, reading Baudelaire, is to perhaps participate in a myth, a myth of the highest level, when the mythical hero merges with the real person and his fate. Is, is, is his own creation. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, for an extremely comprehensive and a very thoroughgoing exposition of Baudelaire. This was of enormous interest to all of us who listened to you. And we can't really say how much we are grateful to you. But uh, would you like to take any questions? Well, yes, if there are any questions, I'll be very pleased to take them. Fine. Uh, any questions from our audience members? Uh, there is a question from one of our students. Yes. Uh, Showman, could you please ask, ma'am? Uh, Showman, please ask the question. I think madam may not be able to access the chat box. <laughs> OK, sir. Uh, well. Uh, Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, I can hear you. OK. So in Baudelaire poem, uh, as Roy Campbell translated to the reader, and also uh, T.S. Eliot introduced this specific line in his The Wasteland. And the line, glow, the line goes, Hippocrit uh, lectio, mo semble, mo fere. And in third lesson, hypocrite uh, reader, you, my twine, my brother. Though Campbell introduced the personal pronoun like you, so I think Baudelaire tries to directly address the reader and perhaps also consider the reader as his alter ego. And then my question is why he addressed the reader as hypocrite? Well, the two, you really asked two questions. Why uh -huh. it is slightly different in the, well, the other translation, it is this. In French, there are two uh, forms of you, thou and you. It's not like that in English, but in, in Bengali, say, like, tu me or apni. Baudelaire uh, calls the, the, the term thou, <laughs> to me. The other, I think, is you. The more important question, why he calls his readers hypocrite. Well, that is explained by the, if you read the whole poem, that will explain. Baudelaire speaks of anui, that monster, which is boredom, carried to its extreme limit, Boredom finding its outlet in cruelty. Boredom, which smokes a hookah while dreaming of scaffolds. That is a mixture of luxury and cruelty. Uh, cruelty expressed through luxury, a luxury expressed through cruelty. And hypocrite reader, my image, my brother, Bodhler declares that directly addressing the reader, you, or in the French form, thou, which is more familiar, he thinks that you understand what I am saying. You know the meaning of ennui. You too have felt in the same way. If you have not actually dreamt of scaffolds while smoking a hookah, you are quite capable of doing it. 
you are only hiding your own feelings, your own uh, your own wishes from others. So naturally, hypocrite reader, my image, my brother, is a um, a caustic comment, a reproach. Yes, you reader, reading my poetry, you might be shocked, you might condemn me, as does many readers, although Baudelaire has many fans, he has also many critics. For instance, I mentioned our own Abu Sayyad Ayub, the great Rovindo critic. So Ayub detested Baudelaire. He says that she's a genius, but a genius, well, evil genius. And only those Bengalis who are addicted to whiskey, the Dirang Kripta whisking pivot, would like him. Well, Baudelaire sort of throws a challenge to these readers, to critics, saying that reading my work, you condemn me, you blame me, you think I'm wicked. But look in the mirror. You are the same, even if you don't admit it. I believe this is the meaning. Ma'am, is it also because the reader uh, uh, do not uh, accept the decadence that uh, Baudelaire present in his poems, and therefore he also called uh, the reader as hypocrite? Yes, this is a very likely reason. The reader does not accept what he says. And in fact, the picture that he presents of the world is not an attractive one. And most readers wouldn't want to accept it. They wouldn't want to say that the world is like this. To them, both they expose a challenge. You are a hypocrite. You are really like that, but you won't acknowledge it. I think this is the Thank you so much, ma'am, for your answer. I'm delighted. Professor Rajchodhri, any other questions from our students or anyone else in the audience? Mm -hmm. Any other question? I'd be glad to answer it. Ma'am, may I ask a question? Please. Ma'am, you mentioned the poem Swan, where the swan escapes from the menagerie and then uh, looks for water in the gutter. Yes, yes. So in that sense, how is the feeling of claustrophobia and imprisonment, which a menagerie, of course, uh, you know, um, symbolizes, how does that also translate into the city of Paris? If you could talk a little perhaps more about that. I mean, in other words, you're free, but you're not really free. You think you're free. I think that's what I wanted to ask you. You're very right. The theme of claustrophobia often appears in Baudelaire, in uh, uh, poems like uh, the Threshare or the Damned Women pictures, the boudoir, the bedroom, as a kind of claustrophobic prison, from the window of which uh, he can be uh, watched. For the swan, I don't think that the swan image is exactly part of claustrophobia. Because the swan, after all, has escaped from the menagerie, although it's not in a very happy position, going about the streets, pecking for water in the gutter. It's apparently the dry season. So here is, I think, more of an alienation, a solitude, being somewhere which is not his real place. Like the Negress, the Negress would be in sun-wrenched Africa. Instead, we don't know by, by uh, for what reason or in what manner, She's in Paris, which obviously she doesn't like. Ardromach, the princess of Troy, the wife of the great Hector, should have been in the royal palace of Troy. Instead, she is either a prisoner of Pyrrhus or an exile to the Trojan colony and a forced marriage with her brother-in-law. So to the the swan. I the claustrophobia is in fact a frequent theme in both that I mentioned that poem where he as Paris in the rainy season with a, as a casserole, you know, a casserole, a big cooking dish like this, with a lid shut tight, is a very great example of claustrophobia. So claustrophobia is a, 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 a not uncommon theme in both there, but in this particular poem, the swan, I think we have not so much claustrophobia, but well, alienation, solitude, somebody being uh, displaced, somebody in a place where she or he or it do not really belong. 
right. thank you so much ma'am thank you i'm delighted would anyone else have any other questions no. good evening ma'am i have a yes. question ma'am ma'am is there any gothic context in the oh. poems of charles baudelaire as we yes. find in the poem the raven yes. like edgar allan poe you are very right actually if there had been more time i would have brought in the theme of gothic in baudelaire edgar allan poe as you know a writer of, of, of mystery and horror story in fact he has been called the first detective story writer in uh, stories like the purloined letter or murder on the rue morgue or of uh, horror stories like the telltale heart the black cat the pit and the pendulum the fall of the house of usher the gothic theme is very well uh, very clear in what's his name edgar allan poe this is one of the, uh, the greatest gothic writers of the period the gothic but has uh, began in germany then into england and to to the you know, the english to their cousins across the atlantic and although bodle was not exactly a gothic writer like poe not in that sense although he was a great admirer of poe he was i think one of the most noted poe scholars and he crossed swords with those americans who well wanted to put down poe he wrote a long well, a mini biography of poe very violently attacks those who had uh, attacked uh, uh, poe I, i mean he even points out that isn't there a law in america that prevents dogs from entering cemeteries graveyards he compares a critic to one who is desecrating the grave of bodlet and again a point which i would have brought in if i had time i spoke of both their relationship with his mother he adored her but he also felt that she had let him down in the poe essay in poe's biography essay he speaks a great deal of a uh, women in poe's life his aunt and his mother in law both aunt and mother in law because he had married one of his girl cousins well apparently this let's say the mother the spiritual mother the adoptive mother of poe always helped him supported him while he was alive and when she is his after he had died she did a best to preserve her memory although bodlet doesn't see so directly reading this essay i could have thinking that bodlet had his own mother in mind so he said this is what a poet's mother should be poe's mother was it even his real mother is his aunt and mother in law but he played the role which you should have played and come to the other point gothic yes all the first could both there wasn't a gothic right in the sense of poe but there were gothic elements in his poetry by gothic i mean so well, what we today would call a horror story or a horror moving horror movie or something to do with the either the supernatural or uh, ghosts or things like that or at least if not go something very horrible in this life gothic literature was co covered beginning for us as i said in germany going on to england and then to the america curious enough gothic wasn't so much of a fashion in france i mean french literature at the time you don't see that, that many ghosts and uh, and things like that heine I, i was just moving a bit from my point but it's interesting heine the great german poet and critic heine when comparing 19th century french and german literature with this point why he says is the gothic that much apparent in french literature why are there so many ghosts and things and like in german or even in english he says that this is the difference between paris and say germany paris the nights are full of great fun activity night clubs and things like that so ghosts wouldn't have much of a place there or if there were ghosts in paris they themselves would start night clubs and enjoy themselves they wouldn't want to waste their time haunting people well it's this very witty reverses that it does show that gothic wasn't that much prevalent in france as it was in germany or england or america but in both the other elements of gothic Take for instance one of his poems, the Seven Old Men. The Seven Old Men 
the poet sees seven old men in the street, but they don't appear ordinary old men. They are absolutely old, well, let's say, old to the power of infinity. And they're bent over, bent down, as if their bodies were at right angles. Of course, one sees old men who can't walk straight, who will use sticks. But these were absolutely at right angles with their bodies. This is somewhat exceptional. And their eyes, their eyes are full of hatred, of bitterness. What they say, they look so pathetic that many people would have given them arms, given them money, but only they are frightened to see their faces. And what is more, what is even so strange, all the seven look exactly like each other, though they were all twins. And the poet, in great fright, runs away from there, wonders what it is. So you can call perhaps the seven old men as a kind of, let's say, a, a mini example of Gothic. For seven can be seen in a different ways. Seven, you know, for one thing, seven can be something nice and beautiful. Or seven can be equated with the seven deadly sins of Christianity. And here we come to a Victorian poet, Swinburne, who was an admirer and critic of, uh, who had written both their criticism. In one poem of Swinburne, we find his lines, there are seven lilies in the water, seven stars in the sky, seven sins for the king's daughter, deep on her soul to lie. Here, seven is both seen as a seven, a sort of poetic number, and also as an equation with the, what is what you call the, uh, the sins of Christianity. So, although the Gothic isn't very prevalent in Baudelaire, it wasn't in any of the contemporary French writers, so reasons for that. So, Heine had said about the ghosts enjoying themselves in Paris, not doing their duty of haunting people, frightening people. But there are Gothic elements in Baudelaire, the poem I've just mentioned, and once or twice in, the, in other works as well. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank Delighted. you, Delighted. Professor Deshra Chakraborty, for giving us this wonderful exposition. Well, you know something about French ghosts and German ghosts now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for giving okay. us this exposition and I'm insight to speak, to speak into to the mind and the works of Baudelaire. Uh, it's time to wrap up our program. And for that, we have Dr. Muthuchandra Rajodhari of Desnew. Department of English, Sister Nivedit University, to conclude <laughs> the proceeding formally. Dr. Rajudri, over to you, please. Thank you so much, sir. And, ma'am, what can I say after that incredible lecture? If I may borrow uh, something from what you said, you talked about the images of jewels in Baudelaire. May I say, that we are enriched by the pearls of wisdom that you have given us in this sh such short period of time. We, I wish we had long, we had, we had a longer time with you. We had a longer lecture with you. I'm sure in future we will. Um, it, what was so distinct about this lecture is that uh, many of our uh, us English literature students, when we first enter the domain of English literature, we only get to know about Baudelaire in relation to T.S. Eliot. And rarely, rarely do we find the range that you have covered from Baudelaire's um, uh, background as a revolutionary to the various themes in his poetry. And you explained uh, them so lucidly with such, uh, you know, uh, specific examples. I'm sure we are all not just delighted, but enlightened, truly, truly enlightened. So thank you very, very much, ma'am. It was an absolute delight, privilege, honor, and a pleasure. Uh, and then uh, as uh, we sh must, uh, it is, uh, I know it's 8.30, so we do need to conclude and we do need to mention certain people um, before formally concluding. So may I just start with our chancellor, uh, Mr. Shottam Raichudri, without whose vision, Sister Nivedita University would not be 
in existence our vice chancellor sir who dr dhruva jyoti chattopadhyay who is tireless in his efforts to encourage us to go in different and new horizons and therefore take our department in particular and also the university to newer and greater heights our dear uh, respected registrar sir who is always our go to person for any kind of problems be it logistical academic or otherwise um and finally uh coming to desnew the team desnew desnew obviously standing for the department of english snu uh of course headed you know steered by our mentor and director dr shubhit dhar and headed by dr prabal rai choudhury but of course each and every faculty member of desnew uh thank you so much for your efforts and students scholars and faculty members both from snu and outside thank you so much for joining us tonight and of course enjoying as i said mams pearls of wisdom and as a final note uh, i would like to add that we would try and upload this lecture on our uh, youtube channel desnew does have a youtube channel and we are not going to no no i'm not asking you to uh, unload you i'm saying that we would upload this ho uh, hopefully uh, well, we will be very glad if you do yes yes we would be very uh, we would I, i i'm pretty sure that we would be able to upload it on our des new channel on our youtube des new channel and of course we will continue with this effort that we have started this initiative that we have started which is called saturday with uh, with a scholar uh, in the coming months as well and as and when we have these we will of course be advertising them on our various social media channels and without further ado if i may borrow and a slightly misquote feste we will choose to please you another night good night everyone thank you good night thank you everyone this has been a great experience we were here that I would request everyone to kindly mute the